Okay, then it's uh, 10 o'clock and uh, we always take pride in starting sharp. So uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to this and uh, currently we are uh, short, just short of 50 participants and there are 98 to sign up for this. Uh, we'll see how many joins uh, at the end. We have a, a very exciting one and a half hour in front of us. Uh, for the sake of good order, this uh, event is being recorded. So uh, uh, NPD is recording it and we'll put it out on the on the force pages so that you can share it uh, with your colleagues that had not the opportunity to join us just now. And it can be watched at a later stage. We have uh, three good uh, presentations, one from Fishbone, Christian Solhau, on uh, the development of uh, the tool. After that, Bor Haukland will share with us the uh, experience that Equinor has. And uh, finally, uh, Fabian Bjornset will uh, take us through the modeling and measures of the Fishbone's performance with Arca BP. All of these sessions are approximately half an hour long, and we'll save the questions for the end of each of the sessions. So when when Christian uh, is done with the Fishbones presentation, we'll, uh, we'll have a five minute uh, Q&A session. And um, similarly after Bor and after Fabian. Um, this uh, webinar is arranged by Tor Blunk, uh, Bjorn Musen and myself. We are the chairs of, of the, the drilling and wells uh, section in, in force. Um, and with that, uh, welcome to everyone. And I will give the word immediately to, to Christian. And I will stop sharing my screen with the agenda. So Christian, if you can uh, start sharing your presentation, that would be good. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, also thank you for the invitation to this, uh, to this seminar. So uh, I will uh, share the screen. OK, can you see it? Yes, we can see it. OK, that's good. OK, so we have uh, 25 minutes, so I will be short uh, today. Um, my name is Christian Solhau. I've been working for Fishbones. Uh, this is my 11th year in Fishbones. Uh, before that, in Halliburton, in variable uh, development positions. So the first four years as a uh, R&D manager on Fishbones, and now I'm heading up the, the development, business development, and uh, account management in in Fishbones. The, this, the, the technology is, uh, the idea came from Rune Freya, that's a, it's a Norwegian inventor, back in 2004 already. So we used almost 10 years to develop the, the concept uh, to actually run it in a commercial well. So that was end of 2013. So I'm going to talk you through the, the last 10 years, which is the most uh, relevant for, for you guys where we are today and what was required to actually come where we are and also a little bit on the future where we look, uh, how can we contribute to making uh, uh, wells even better? In the, and we're focusing on the drilling technology and also focusing on the North Sea here today. So uh, fish ponds, we uh, a little, a little um, background where we are working and also how the technology is uh, deployed. So we can start with the, the equipment itself. It's a hardware system. Uh, if you see the, the screen to the uh, screenshot to the left, it's a typical uh, picture of how the reservoir uh, looks like after it's been stimulated with, uh, with fish balls. To run and hold with equipment, and then you pump out the needles, taking two, three, four hours, depending on how many needles you have. And the needles are titanium, tubes, they are not uh, hoses, they are stiff and they're building up the same angle independent on the formation actually. We can penetrate any formation, uh, we have not been, we have not found any formation that we cannot make holes in. Just to get the grip on the length here, the, the needles uh, itself are 12 meter long, so they are physically placed inside the liner. Uh, so the, uh, the fish post assemble will be 13 meters long, so you have a sub hair, with the threads and the connections that you need uh, that operators uh, uh, spec up and then you talk it to the line. 
12 meter so so you have the 13 meter assembly for each three or four needles going out so maybe it's also with I, I think it can be wise to go through the animation to see how the the equipment's actually deployed so we are operating worldwide uh, the biggest markets uh, as of today is the middle east uh, where we have uh, several volume contracts. The most important probably at the moment are Abu Dhabi, as Adnok uh, have uh, seen this um, with the last two, three cases, they have seen a uh, humongous uh, success, uh, increasing the, the, problem, the productivity with four times. We also see success in the, in the North Sea. Two of the cases are going to be presented uh, today with Lundin on Advagrig are seeing uh, two and three times increase the productivity after uh, several months uh, with producing every time. As well as Mexico, we see uh, a big uh, potential as well as, as China. And for your information, we are not doing any business with uh, Russia at the moment. So we had several prospects last year in Russia. A lot of uh, potential, but uh, that is of obvious reasons we are not dealing with uh, with Russia. Uh, we divide our technology into two main parts. We have the fishbone suggesting, which was developed first. That was the first uh, job we did in 2013. Uh, but we saw limitations with this technology in terms of the hardness of the formation. We were not able to jet through uh, hard uh, formations. We tried with the abrasives, but there was not, we didn't make a complete hole for, for uh, uh, sufficient uh, jetting. So we developed the fishbowl drilling system, which you see here to the right. Uh, you have turbines. For each turbine, will uh, drive a bit on the other uh, on the other end, and to get the feel for the sizes, the bit size is 12 millimeters. So we make up to 13 mil millimeter hole on each of these. So this one you will pump inside the line I have and then you will uh, activate the needles and they will just drill out in a couple of hours. So uh, let me take a couple of minutes to run through the animation app. I hope the link works. It's a bit slow connection here I see and that is unfortunate. Okay, there it comes. Can you see the, okay, there it is. I just jumped a bit, so let me uh, stop the movie here. So uh, this is what um, this is a, just a cut through of the, the fishbowl assembly. So there, the one meter sub here you see is connected to the 12 meter liner, and you place the needles physically inside uh, each liner. So you have three needles for each sub assembly uh, with, with fishbowls. The red part here is. Um, Drill through disc is a protection while you run and hold to make sure that the needles are inside the liner uh, and don't uh, uh, are not deployed before you come to TV. So when these are made up, we typically make up 10 assemblies uh, one day. So if you have 50 subs, you will take five days to assemble all 50 subs. Everything's deployed, everything's ready. You send it to the rig. And then you run this, you run fishbones as a part of the completion string. So there's no additional time connected to run and hold here with, uh, with fishbones. You only need to consider the, the filtering of the fluid that's important for us. You can run this with any fluid. You run it with open or packers, uh, you can run it with any other tools. Uh, as long as you, uh, you need to make sure that you don't exceed a certain pressure while you run and hold because you, uh, you have the pressure activated anchors, which I will come, uh, come to in a, in a second. So when you come to TD, the first thing you do is to set the liner hanger slips. You are able to circulate throughout the system. But you don't set the pack up because you will circulate during the, during the setting of the equipment. The next stage, you ramp up the pressure and flow to activate the anchors. The open hole anchors are also, uh, the, that's fishbones equipment. Uh, set typically uh, to 60 bar. And they, these are activated within 10 seconds. Each of these anchors will anchor up to 50 ton each. You ramp up flow uh, further to get the pressure of around 100 bar. There you have a burst disc. 
Do uh, the bursters uh, have the purpose of um, uh, opening up when you need to activate the needles? Because the needles need a certain flow and pressure to operate uh, within a certain spec. So the spec are 1200 liters and above, and all the pressures between 50 and 100 bar to, to drill out uh, properly. So when this burst disc opens, a secondary opening uh, is available, and then you are able to pump with the sufficient rate and pressure to activate the needles. So we start at 1200 liters and we ramp up to uh, up to 1800 liters uh, during three, four hours time. For the Lundin case, we drilled for six hours in total. The first four hours, we saw a lot of activity. And the last two was just confirmation and we saw flat lines and that indicated that all the needles were uh, were fully fully out in the reservoir. So just a snapshot of uh, of uh, the zoom in of the, the needle itself. You have the rotating bit here at the end and you have an outer needle, which is titanium. Uh, that's not rotating, but it's an inner rod that's actually connected to the ro to the uh, rotor on the other side, which are rotating the bit. And you have a small flow of mud on the inside there to cool down a bit and also remove cuttings as this is spinning really, really fast. You are talking about the RPM of uh, 1500. Then you're just pumping and then in, in hours you are finished and then you complete the upper completion and you go in with the uh, production string. And set the well on production. I saw him being a bit quick. We are. We don't have too much time. Okay. So um, moving on, um, we have done 35 jobs in total. Uh, now 15 are offshore, and we see a, a high on high interest in high end wells. We would rather do a 10 to 15 percent increase in uh, in high end well than 1,000 percent increase in a low producing well. There's no limitations here in terms of temperature and depth, uh, up to 200 degrees, of course, and we can run up to 80 subs. That's what we've seen. So it's, so far we have run 61, and that was the second well on uh, Edvard Grieg. The only limitation we see in combination with other equipment is that we cannot run with uh, with uh, gravel pack, and we can't run with uh, with cement. Whereas we've run in most of the other um, uh, technologies like MLT, we've done several of, the, of those. There's no uh, limitations regarding sand screens, and but we need the ICD module inside because we need a certain pressure to pump out. So we can't run pre-drilled uh, liner in our system. Of course, you can come in and run a pre-drilled liner in the in the lateral, or as long as it's set afterwards. We run with flat and with frac sleeves and tracers and time shoes and perforations, and we can also run it with the um, with the Versa Flex uh, as long as it's set afterwards. The liner hanger, Halle buttons. Just a li uh, list of um, uh, benefits. Uh, we see the biggest benefit in slightly deviated or highly deviated wells uh, horizontally. Well, because the needles, when they come up, they increase the vertical permeability, which normally are much lower than the horizontal permeability. What's important also to take with you is that we don't increase the surface area that much with pumping out 200, 300 uh, needles. The holes are so small. Uh, connectivity here is the key. You connect to the reservoir and you increase the radius, but we don't increase the area. If you need contact area, you need to drill another well or a dual lateral or whatever. But this that's very important to understand. And now a bit over to a real case study. So uh, we will also present this next week in the, the, the drilling conference in Kristiansand, which is in Norwegian, by the way. But they are going to present this one together with uh, Tore Flicka. Uh, he's been uh, our contact person several years in Lundin. I'm going to talk about uh, what we need to do to make sure that we could develop this one in very uh, challenging formation, which is the conglomerate in, on Edvard Grieg. 
Um, to be able to do this, we have run numerous of uh, developments, and uh, Lundin has been by far our best uh, supporter since day one. Uh, together with uh, Stato, at that time, Equidor, and ENI, and of course uh, the Research Council and Innovation Norway, we developed the drilling system. But there is not only the drilling system, because the first one was deployed on, uh, on Smurbok in 2015. That was not as challenging uh, as the conglomerate, because this is a Gaon formation sandstone with some of the shale stringers. What we saw was really challenging was to make a system that could drill through conglomerate, which is like a huge um, uh, variety in um, uh, properties in the rock, from very, very soft and unconsolidated sand to granite and even quartz. How are we able to steer the needles so it's not going like a, uh, like a snake, but actually builds up a, a steady angle? So through um, numerous of the JRPs, continuous studies, uh, we were able to uh, develop a system in 2019. We're finished to uh, to uh, to run in the conglomerate field. In addition, they also see other. Um, uh, advantages with the uh, equipment and we have two ongoing projects with Lundin at the moment and we have three with Docker VP. So because they see even further into the future how they can get even more out of our, out of our uh, technology here. Just an example of what we have done to be uh, to, to make this robust enough and uh, to get confidence. How, can we do this in in uh, conglomerate and offshore without any risk? We went out. Uh, this is an outcrop at Vigdil outside Stavanger. So we drilled a hole in the and this is really, really hard. It's almost granite um, hardness. So we, we drilled a hole in in the in the mountain here. And we put well, several holes, by the way, and we put the sub inside and we drilled the needle up until it actually came out there in nine meter further up. Uh, fortunately, there was no sheep at the moment, but this is actually a, a farm outside Stavanger. So here you see the needle comes up. And this is Arne Ek, this is a Lundin uh, employee, uh, still, still is, and still in the business and he is a promoter as, uh, as well. So he saw, the, saw this himself. Not sure if he's in the call today, but uh, he's uh, he is uh, he's always been involved from from day one. This is also at Victor, but this is an, it's a different way of setting it up where we have the anchor and uh, two needles at the same time drilling in the actual formation. So we had a lot of rounds with the geo geologists in, in uh, Lundin building analogs to uh, Edvard Grieg, the conglomerate. So here you see the actual uh, sample here to the right. And we build these blocks with different cement types and also different gravel uh, up to uh, granite uh, hardness. So all of these blocks here are different analogs to what they see and feel they will get in, in the LR Greek formation. And then when we, um, we drill out the ne needles, two needles simultaneously, as you see the needles in between here, uh, we can measure the RP and if the needle drops off or uh, up or down or and, and also the, the angle build up. So we get a lot more of information by doing this than, for instance, just running a rob, uh, uh, well in Ulrich or Xrig or wherever. So we do this on land. And that's been an uh, advantage we had from day one. We always do this so we can see what we are doing. And I, I will show you uh, a video. Not sure if you can hear the sound. But here is a picture of the typical drilling setup through the conglomerate uh, stones. Sometimes it slows down, and that's because it needs a hard rock, it needs the granite, and then it drills slow. If it meets the soft cement, it drills faster. This tongue here is only to see how fast it drills and slow. Fast, and there you can see the spray out of the bit going back until it gets through the formation and, and then it goes into the next block. Seven minutes like this. So this is how we, we do the uh, development uh, of the drilling system and we are continuously doing uh, projects. So we, I will encourage all of you to uh, contact us if you want to see this in person. We have the head uh, office uh, quarter in, uh, in uh, Stavanger, in Fogos. 
So you will be uh, welcome to see this uh, yourself. Just the result, uh, the result of the first job, the ACE 17, which was a standalone uh, fish bones well on, on Alva Grey. This was 1100 meters, and we uh, pushed as many subs as possible in this uh, section here. 53 subs with 159 holes drilled uh, simultaneously. Um, first, they, they got up to 10, uh, 10 times better productivity, which uh, we thought was really, really well. Now, uh, since, since then, I think it's up down to two, uh, three times, but uh, you might you might uh, update me, some of you guys from AquaBP on that. The second well was a uh, dual lateral, where we placed 61 subs in, in, the, in the main bar. And the lateral was a pre drill liner, just open hole uh, 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 completion. And this is the dual lateral we talked about. So we placed, uh, we pumped out the needles first in the, in the main bar. Then we went in with a pre drill liner. Oh, it's not a pre drill liner, by the way, sorry, it's, uh, it's uh, open hole screens. And what we pulled out from the Lundin webpage uh, the, after the jobs was uh, was this one. Uh, you can read by yourself, I'll send it to you afterwards. But uh, the 10 times increase in productivity uh, was flagged as a great success. And of course, we are, we are making SB paper as we speak, and we're going to present that together with Lundin in Houston uh, at the ATCE conference next month as well. And of course, this is what we have so far. Uh, we have developed uh, fish ponds to, to be run in almost any formation in the world. Uh, we can combine with uh, almost any uh, technology as well, so we don't see any big limitations. Uh, the limitations is uh, within the reservoir itself. So it's important to know where you can run fish ponds because we, we cannot run fish ponds in any formation. It needs to be within a certain probability range. So we're talking about 0.1 millidarcy up to 100, and that's also something that Equinor um, has uh, concluded with. Uh, you probably will talk about that board later today as well, so I won't uh, go into that. Uh, we also have uh, further developments. As I mentioned, we have uh, six ongoing JRPs, uh, and these are some of them. We can, we can know, we can actually stare the needles where they're going out, and that's planned to be finalized uh, start next year. We can do injection in, uh, with the drilling system. We are looking into CCS. Uh, we are also in post acid jetting where we can optimize. And also we're doing this particle control project uh, together with ARCA BP, uh, where they have been struggling for, uh, for yes, uh, on yes on Valhall with chalk production. So we have a system where we can actually filter out the chalk. Uh, so they uh, limit chalk production and also optimize the productivity. So uh, there we will probably run in in the next well in the next uh, in, in, in August, but you will probably also give an update on that, Fabian, as long as you were on the call. In future, we have future projects that we want to run. Uh, we want to run uh, longer needles, and we also want to be able to drill through case hole and then into formation, which personally I think is uh, the most challenging project we will ever have. And also we're looking into different sizes and we know that uh, customers want to develop and uh, want to, uh, more challenging formations and uh, applications, so we will have further development as well. So I'm not sure if we, um, I think I'm going to drop, I have a couple of more slides, but I guess we will talk in, we will talk into this when I is presenting. So maybe I'll leave the floor for questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, anybody that has any. Um, yeah, you don't have to raise your hand. We're we rude people in drilling, so just ask. Mm. Yeah, just a comment for me, uh, Kjell Kristoffersen in OKBP. Uh, as you say, they, these are quite thin uh, titanium uh, tubes, and within that you have an even thinner. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you would call it very thin string and on the end of that it is a bit the bits that rotating yeah and if someone came to us and suggested that this would be possible to do i think we will just shake in our heads and say no no this is not possible 12 meter long this thin will never work 
So it's quite amazing that you actually have gotten it to work. And all the tests show that it does work. But then when, when you run it in a well, uh, how do you monitor that uh, they actually go into the formation? Do you have any pressure monitoring or something uh, bumping and pressure increasing or dropping? And uh, how can you make sure that this actually works? Yeah, it's a very good question. And we we, uh, we have uh, had many different ideas when we drill out, if you can have a ball that gets produced back or how can we get the positive ID? And that is a very, that's a hundred dollar question because uh, the, the only thing you have to monitor is the pressure, as you said, the pressure and the cur and the and the, uh, the rates. And what we have seen, the eight drilling jobs we have done so far around globally, um, all of them show a lot of activity in the in the time we actually expect them to drill. So if it's one hour, we are, we 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 see by the RP testing up front in the actual formation how fast it will go. So it's depends on the RP. So but if you have a slow um, like the conglomerate, we expected this one in as like eight for instance, we expected four hours to get all the needles out. And during that period, we saw a lot of activity mostly. Uh, excuse me, please, please huh? mute if you're, if you're not. Uh, okay, that's okay. Yeah, maybe you can hear me if I. Uh, yes. Oh, we talked to them. Okay, so so uh, for for Lundin, for instance, the, during the four-hour uh, period, we saw a um, decrease in pressure, but also a lot of spikes uh, up and down. We kind of count each needle. This needle is going out, and now it actually is fully out. But we can see the trend. So throughout the, you get actually less and less activity until flat lines during the drilling operation. So we have seen that in every every job, which is quite uh, uh, a good confidence that we have done a good job. Thank you for that answer. We we'll go to the next question from Ingve Bolsta Johansen. Yes, um, <clears throat> I saw. Um, uh, it was mentioned that uh, this was combined with the uh, AICVs, um, and then uh, my I am assuming that when you are uh, benefiting from from these needles, you are producing from the annulus. Uh, yeah. I assume then uh, around those needles, not inside. That's only to make the bit rotate, right? Did That's I understand? Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it was just good to get that confirmed. The other thing I was just wondering about these uh, turbines that you have inside these subs, that is naturally uh, preventing you for from future intervention, I guess. Um, having these in the in the in, in inside the, the the completion, how does that affect uh, productivity later uh, compared to our conventional setup? Yeah, the, uh, yeah, that's a very good question, and that's a question we get a lot because the equipment in the system is, uh, you, you know, you, you cannot access it. <laughs> on the small book job, we um, on PB1, we run this in 2015, and it's still producing. At the top of the system here, we have a, a catcher screen. In case you get any debris or one of these turbines uh, fall off or you know, the rotors fall, uh, fall off, they will actually be kept in the system. You will not, you will never produce anything through it. So they're still producing over the system. Each turbine itself don't create a big uh, pressure drop. So you're talking about 80, 900 liters and you have 0.1 bar pressure drop over the system here. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not the significant pressure drop you actually get. It's fully open. So, uh, so, so you are correct. But we have not, uh, up, to, up till today, um, cleaned out the needles. We, we can do it, but we have not. And I think that is a cost issue because on the rig offshore, you need to take the time to run in, go through and retrieve. And you need to do that a couple of times. And that would uh, require a lot of rig time to do. And that's why we haven't done it, but uh, it's uh, fully possible. It just takes a lot of time and money. Yeah. Well, I yeah. guess it could be uh, one point to put up for also further development. Uh, I mean, if you just a uh, bullhead or inject some fluid uh, that can remove these turbines, uh, I guess that would be the most elegant, I guess. Yeah. 
that is elegant on the turbines and that is that's that's easy because we can make them in magnesium and we just pump down the down the brine or uh, or salt water or something like that but uh, the problem is the needles that cannot be dissolved because you have titanium uh, that's quite difficult to dissolve and also the inner needle which is uh, piano wire quite high high strength steel so it's uh, not that easy to dissolve actually thank you for that uh those uh, comments. Uh, in the interest of time, we will not take any further questions. Uh, we will move on to the next presenter. But you're all encouraged to, to take contact uh, uh, with Christian Solo from Fishbone uh, directly if you have any more questions. Um, so with that, um, a big round of applause. I guess I'll find the applause uh, thing here. Uh, Thank you for that. Time. Yeah. Uh, very, very good presentation. And uh, for the rest of you, please uh, note that it has been recorded and you can share it with your colleagues that were unable to attend. So moving on to um, to the next presenter, uh, Bård Haukland from Equino. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I've shared my presentation. You can see it? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Okay. Um, so as Christian has already told you a bit about the technology, um, I'll talk a little bit about the formation that we have introduced this technology in, uh, about those wells and the experience we have had, and just a summary at the end. So in actually Iruna Freya visited us in 2012 or 13, and then he had this idea about this uh, fishbowl. Uh, but for for Smurbuk Sur as such, um, we have um, uh, this dome structure uh, where we've had injection on the top and then produces at the edges. And it was the lower garn that was started, which is a much better property based, uh, delta based uh, field. Uh, which does not need any stimulation. Uh, and then afterwards, we introduced the other formations like Ile and Tilje, which are a bit, uh, have slightly different properties. And in 2015, as, as was mentioned, uh, we started on the marginal facies, is this upper garn well, which is, uh, is the one that we'll concentrate on. And it was situated, is, is uh, you see the, PP1 and the PP2 is here. So they are on top of the structure uh, with uh, on top of the entire structure and uh, the properties here are, as, as I said, marginal. And one of the reasons why we chose fish bones in the first place is that the formation itself is rather thin. So trying to use conventional type of fracturing is a I would say a challenge to control the fracture length such that it does not fracture into the underlying or overlying uh, structures and then this idea came from fish bones uh, to to actually introduce this where you actually can control the fracture length so then we will put the well sort of in the middle and then we will access up and down or to the sides, uh, most of the entire reservoir package. And as, as Christian mentioned, uh, getting access across uh, these shale stringers and increase the vertical uh, connection it is a major benefit of using uh, fish bones. And, and as mentioned also, the vertical permeability is normally very low. Uh, these sands are from from at maximum 10 and down to 1 millidarcy. So it's it's rather tight. And also another benefit uh, for this running it this initially is that uh, since Fishbone does not have as of yet a, a good, uh, let's say, sand control system, this uh, sand is very comp competent and does not need any sand control. 
so we could run uh, with a quite simple setup and 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 introduce the needles quite efficiently into the system. So the PB1 well was the first well that we we tried this technology in. Um, and as there was some skepticism, I must admit, uh, to, to trying this new technology in here, we elected to have uh, one branch uh, with conventional system as a pretty liner, and then the other, other branch was with this uh, fish bones. And one of the good things, as, as also Christian mentioned, is that you can intermix where you put the, the fish bone. So we actually had uh, one, the, the well path is quite up and down in this, uh, in this uh, reservoir. And then in, in some of the cases, we had to shift where we put, placed the, the fish bones and, uh, and then introduce blanks instead so that we could uh, avoid getting in out of the reservoir or more into the reservoir below. And so that's another good thing with the fish bones that you can actually put them actually where you want. Uh, for the PB2, uh, so I can say that this is this is two branches in the same formation in the upper garn, while the new well that was drilled last year, uh, we have one uh, branch in the lower garn, which is a much better uh, reservoir that doesn't need any stimulation and is mostly gas filled. And then the other branch here is the PB2 upper garn where we actually introduced then the fish bones as such. So the the is a is MLT but they are slightly different uh, setup. For the PB1 uh, we introduced also uh, tracers uh, for two things is it's one is it was for uh, verification of the cleanup how does that how does that look and also to get a feel for the contribution between the the main bore uh, of uh, with fish bones and the lateral without and and we've tried the different ways of looking at this. We've tried, uh, we started with what we expected. And at this time we didn't have a good, okay, we didn't have a very good tool for trying to model this, but we did use uh, computational flow dynamics, which is a very, very fine scaled simulation that indicated that assuming that both branches have the same properties, we should get 10 to 20 percent more out of a fishbone uh, installation um, and that was what we saw actually from the logs that they are more or less the same in, in setup with respect to pi and, and uh, pressures um, then we also did an inflow uh, tracer evaluation um, which indicated quite substantially that the fishbone completion produce quite a lot more than the lateral. Uh, we also did a PLT, uh, which is showing here that, that, that you get most of your production from, from this bone, and, and of those 100%, 50% is coming from this fish bone uh, section. So in, all in all, the, the performance of fish bone for upper garn on Smurbuk Sur has been uh, quite good. Um, PB2 uh, has just been started and and uh, we haven't done all, uh, we have done infiltration, but we haven't done any PLT yet to confirm this. Um, but now we have a, a better tool uh, to try to evaluate uh, how does fishbone or any completion uh, perform. Uh, and we've used this REST Insight tool, which is uh, open source, so you can actually uh, use it yourself. And this indicates that that with the fishbone completion in this setting, we should at least get around 20%, 25% more uh, reserves out compared to a pre liner in, in the same formation. Uh, 
for this, well, there were some uh, challenges, uh, both uh, not respect to the to the fishbone itself, but actually the, the completion of the well, which which uh, added some additional issues for us, um, and saw that we did not were not able to start up the well in after we had finished it and uh, we had to do several attempts uh, to actually get it started uh, but as we did get it started we actually also saw the contribution from the fishbone branch was as we expected and in this case it's around a rate of 200 uh, cubes of oil from this branch obviously since the the other branch is in a is in a much better property system that obviously dominates quite substantially in this setting. We also here had two uh, tracers to indicate how how does this uh, contribute and also for the cleanup. Uh, and here is is a bit of a uh, how to interpret that you get quite some response from from the toe but not so much from the heel it could be with how the tracers are set and and and, and so on but it's a bit of a conundrum in that sense but at least it shows that the fishbone completion that we have introduced for both wells has actually been a success um and as Equinor sees it, uh, at least for for Smurbuxer and Oscar, it's it has a, a good solid business case uh, with a low cost. And as we don't uh, we don't actually see any downside risk. You could you could always argue that uh, that it, even if you don't get deployed 100% of the the laterals, you will still get some stimulation. Not all will fail, and I think. In the business case for uh, PB1, we said that we only needed like uh, five percent of the needles to to run out to actually cover the cost. So uh, in that sense, uh, it is a, a good, cheap stimulation uh, tool. And the operational learnings is that the installation and the pumping of fish bones uh, was according to plan for for both wells um, but one thing that we have learned is actually that uh, the clean of, of such wells with very low pis they need time and they need pressure for a, a successful operation uh, so that should be considered when you when you introduce fish bones uh, that you actually need some time to actually clean out uh, and the pressure is a very important thing to evaluate in such a case. Um, also about the hole cleaning, that's more a little bit, maybe more particular on the Smurbox Sur as such that, that we had some issues running in the completion uh, uh, because of, of the large ODs that you introduce uh, with the anchors and everything that you don't have a lot of clearance. So make sure that you evaluate that upfront. Also, the imputation uh, using traces and and PLTs shows that that you get higher productivity from the zones with fish bones compared to uh, to pre-drilled or or existing uh, uh, completion systems. And and as uh, Kristen also touched upon that Equinor believe that we we should evaluate fish bones uh, for any reservoir especially in the range from let's say one to a hundred is is a range that we've set that you should evaluate uh, fish bones and because you do get it's quite a cheap additional thing to do and as Christian also mentioned the pumping and the added operational time is very limited so using that and we will at least in the future also evaluate this for uh, for all the for potential new infill targets in in uh, in equinor fitting this uh, scenario yeah and uh, 
at the end here's this this FSP paper uh, on the first well, which is quite common. And uh, I'll also like to add that uh, Equinoid and Fishbone actually are uh, presenting in this stimulation workshop today or tomorrow. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, Christian, is it today or tomorrow? Um, more or less the same presentation that I've, I've shown here. Um, finally, I would like to acknowledge the partners uh, on OSCAR for allowing to publish this and also thanks to Fishbone for excellent cooperation during, before, during and after uh, installation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bob, for, mm -hmm. for that good presentation. Uh, okay. Any questions to Bob? If there are no questions to Bo, maybe we should uh, pick up who, who didn't get the chance to have a question to Christian. So, because we have some minutes before we will start the, the next presentation. I could ask a question, uh, Christian. Could you do retrofit uh, fishbone installation? What do you mean with retrofit? Like you can. If if you have, let's say you have a, an existing well, let's say with a pre liner or screens or whatever, could you run something inside uh, those systems to, yeah. in theory, increase your productivity? Yeah, we we that depends on the size we need to run through. For, because yeah. if you have a if you have a system which is six inch. ID, then we can run through it because uh, mm. our smaller system, four and a half inch, have, have a 5.7 inch OD. Or, so that yeah, is okay. the restriction. Yeah. And also, uh, if you have an uh, open hole, we can do it. Yeah. Uh, as of now, we cannot drill through casing and then continue into the formation. Those that type of bit doesn't exist. Mm. So, uh, so uh, that, but that's on the plan. Uh, yeah. Maybe but you're not future. planning to make any smaller size systems than four and a half. No, it's not on the plan. We we might be able to do four inch, but smaller than that, you you have so small equipment. The turbine mm. will, will be so small that you don't have enough force to the bit. Yeah. So we have actually we we see we need twenty five kilos to the bit, and uh, with the smaller the turbine, you don't you won't get that. Yeah, that's fine. Good question and good answer. So we move to the next one. That is Marius Lunde. Yes. Hello. Well, thanks for the presentation. I don't seem to ah no it's running yeah so um how do you estimate uh, the i mean how do you evaluate the expected producibility increase uh, from the fishbones application uh, in in equinor for instance oh that's not to me that's to us <laughs> <laughs> um the productivity is a bit hard to calculate, but at least we've used this resin site tool, which um, has a um, uh, eclipse input to to um, to uh, connection factors. So you you actually uh, add productivity in that sense uh, using the rest inside software uh, if I answer your question correctly yeah so you you have estimates on the the added uh, connectivity for the yes. nearby cells then I guess yes that's true okay thanks yep and if or, you use this uh, link here you can get into this rest inside uh, uh, web page and it it can explain it a little bit more in detail if you want. Yeah, uh, just a follow up. Uh, is it your experience that it's, uh, is it fairly, um, does it comply with the results that you're actually getting? Yes, uh, actually, at least for, for this case, uh, actually it was quite spot on, uh, to be honest, uh, this, uh, how much the contribution was from this branch. Uh, that might be lucky, but uh, it was at least in the ballpark of what we expected. Mm. Very good. We're moving on to uh, Michael uh, Noah Kyle. 
may have pronounced that name a little bit bad. Yes, <laughs> Michael Makile. Yeah. Um, my question is uh, is actually for for Epino as well. I mean, if you if you deploy, assuming you deploy this uh, technology on a on a field scale, do you see a possibility of uh, reducing your well count if you're increasing um, productivity by maybe 10x? Are you able to reduce your well count? Yeah, I would say no, but uh, because of the limited uh, reach that uh, Fishbone actually has, that might, it depends a bit uh, on the formation itself and, and how it's set. If I go back, uh, yeah, uh, I'll just show you, Oops. I could share my presentation again. And you see this, you see my slide again? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the upper garn is sort of uh, outline is like like that. So, and you see, I could have placed another well up here, potentially, because the properties deteriorate quite substantially towards the north here. Yeah. And and even with twelve meters, is like this. So it depends a bit on, I would say, the formation, uh, but. In some cases, I would say yes, but in most cases, I would say no, because of the limited reach this has of actually uh, connecting a larger part of the reservoir. So, yeah. So, the, so it the, depends the, a bit on the size of your reservoir, um, but in some cases, uh, you might just want to drill uh, one well with uh, a stimulation rather than three wells, for example. Depends yeah. a bit on the, on the cash uh, flow and, and such. OK, it's Thank not a you. quick yeah. answer to that question. <laughs> no, yeah. I, no, no. Yeah. So we're Thank moving you. on to to the next question from Kekusu Yamamura. I'm certain about the pronunciation there as well. OK, no problem. I'm Keisuke uh, Yamamura. Uh, I'm turning on my video, but it doesn't work, I think. So you mentioned that uh, you introduced the cleanup of the well with low PI needs time for the successful operation as a lesson learned, but uh, it seems to be general. So how does it relate with fish drilling in detail? No, that's not that's not related to fish one as such. Uh, it's it's related to the fact that that's what we've seen, especially uh, I think that one lesson from at least from from Smurdbook Sur and, and the Upper Garn is that in order for a successful uh, cleanup of low perm uh, reservoirs as such, uh, not entirely connected to fishbone, but in, in, in general, you need to spend more time uh, because it's a bit slower to react than than let's say conventional reservoirs. But that's a problem with respect to People on the rig want this to be finished as soon as possible, while we want to clean up the well as much as we can prior to starting production. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why I say that, uh, at least from from Smurdbuxer part, uh, we saw at least in we can clean up anything as long as we have enough pressure. But if you have very low pressure, uh, that be, constitutes a problem regardless of fishbone or not. So it's something to evaluate also in that sense. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Quick yeah. question from Arne Klostad before we move to the last presentation. Yep. Yeah, hi, uh, Arne Klostad from Neptune. Um, yep. um, all these examples that have been uh, presented today are relative competent sandstones. Uh, if you look at fields that you are expecting to have some failure, uh, assume that uh, this will be similar to perforation technology, really, that you have better stability if you have uh, it going into the maximum stress direction, and that you will get complete failure of, of the other needles. Is that uh, something that's been done, and is it been looked at uh, the, that problem? 
can uh, I can answer that. You touched into that also, Anna. You mentioned that the uh, uh, unconsolidated SAN uh, has not been run, but we have done some, and there we expect some of the on the sandstone part in uh, in Elvagrig was unconsolidated. So if we get the collapse done, then it's uh, we might plug the hole because you have the microanalysis is 13 millimeters minus eight because the needle uh, OD is eight millimeters. So you only have five uh, millimeters of total radial to two and a half millimeters to clog up. So that's that's the that's the question. Do you clog up the need the, the producing area or not? Of course you maybe maybe look at it as a mini gravel pack, best case, but worst case you clog it. So, and what what happens then? If you don't have any system, uh, you don't have any um, uh, part of the needle that you can bypass, for, for instance, slotted needle like we do now for, uh, for Arca BP, the Valhall project, then you will risk of losing that needle. So, uh, of course, if you risk that on all, all the, the needles, all the holes, say you have 200, then, uh, then you should have a system where you can bypass the collapse. So uh, the system that we are developing now that we are planning to use next year has um, slots every 28 centimeters. So if you get a collapse in between there, then you can bypass the production you produce inside the needle and then out. And I guess uh, Fabian also will touch into this, why they are doing uh, what they are doing. I'm, I'm not sure, but he might also talk about that. So, so it's a it's a big ongoing discussion we had with Equinor, Rocco BP, and Lundin for a long, long time. Uh, that uh, we also discussed it with Rocco BP on Eva Rosen. They also uh, looked into that and saw that maybe there is some consolidated parts, but they said, okay, if you lose one, two, three needles, that doesn't matter because we have many. So, uh, so it's a very good discussion which has not been fully concluded, but we have a system that we can run that can overcome that risk. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that answer. And maybe Fabian will take us through uh, some of that. We'll, we'll see. At least he will be presenting uh, Aka BP's experience here or Lundin. So, uh, Fabian, take it away. Thank you. I'll just uh, go ahead and share. Yeah, we see your presentation. And now in the full screen. Yep. Um, yeah, so good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Fabian Bjørnset, uh, and I'm a reservoir engineer with uh, Acker BP. Uh, and I've worked on uh, developing a, a system for the Valhall field where we need to take uh, chalk production into account, as uh, Christian mentioned. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about how uh, Acker BP has uh, worked with uh, modeling the uh, expected performance from fish bones, and then how we've measured it in the uh, wells where we tested it. Uh, so the experience uh, for RKBP with fish bones, excluding the uh, Lundin, which is now part of the company from this year, uh, is on Valhall, where we did a pilot well in 2018, uh, and uh, on Ivar Osten, where we ran it in a full well in uh, 2019. Uh, so, and do we have uh, see this as a starting point for some further developments? So we plan uh, to uh, run this in a well on the north flank of Valhall in 2023, and we are evaluating the potential for other wells in the uh, PWP platform on Valhall and on the uh, Nuaka uh, development uh, as well. Uh, and just uh, for uh, disclosure, Arker BP is a shareholder in Fishbones. Uh, so uh, take, uh, if I were you, I would take everything I say with a grain of salt. And so starting out with the modeling bit. So just uh, starting out with the basic, how this is uh, uh, presented uh, from the vendor. Uh, like Christian said, you get the flow into the annulus and uh, in a similar way as a open hole uh, completion, you also have your open hole, which uh, is able to flow then in through the production valves. Um, and uh, how are you going to, uh, uh, how is this going to then be treated in the model? Uh, well, it's uh, going to be open hole performance, 
uh, plus something. So the needles are effectively extending your uh, uh, wellbore uh, radius, if uh, nothing else. Uh, so uh, in the simplest uh, form, you can use uh, perforations, uh, which uh, uh, are modeled or put in at the same length as the uh, uh, needles. And uh, the performance uh, due to the piecemeal uh, coefficient is going to be relatively representative in a homogeneous uh, reservoir. Uh, then you might have a situation like this, where you have uh, a uh, uh, impermeable layer, which is uh, keeping you from accessing uh, a part of the reservoir. Uh, and uh, then you might want to uh, go into some more detailed uh, wellbore modeling to determine the potential production uplift. Uh, and uh, certainly, if you have an even more uh, complex model with uh, large uh, variations in the reservoir quality and vertical uh, permeability, uh, then the potential production uplift from this uh, could uh, significantly exceed what a uh, extended wellbore radius uh, will uh, tell you. So the way at least I see it, uh, uh, the performance uh, that you can expect from fish bones uh, really depends on the type of uh, reservoir that you have. Uh, so, but to get the handle on this, uh, we started out with a mechanistic uh, model on Valhall, where we went down to the uh, exact uh, sizing of a needle uh, and modeled that one as having uh, 200 Darcy permeability uh, and a width of uh, uh, 0.5 centimeters. Uh, and then we took that uh, performance and then uh, scaled it up to uh, another grid that was still refined, but uh, to shorten the runtime, uh, it had been uh, reduced uh, uh, a bit in the grid, grid sizes, uh, and then calibrated the permeability of the fish bones to the performance of the uh, super refined uh, model. And then that uh, model was used to compare uh, the performance of the fish bones with a equivalent prop frac in a mechanistic model to uh, evaluate whether this was going to give us a, a similar uh, performance. And uh, actually, in this case, we have a quite uh, homogeneous uh, model and uh, our chalk uh, on the Valhall field is uh, relatively homogeneous. The KVKH is a big uh, uncertainty, but uh, generally the reservoir properties are not uh, that uh, heterogeneous. So uh, in this case, uh, actually it's possible to uh, use uh, a, uh, we see that the refined uh, grid uh, is not giving that much of a uh, different performance from the uh, crude grid. So we can use this uh, results even for the full field uh, model. The thing you don't uh, necessarily capture here would be very near well effects such as gas coming out of solution on the longer term uh, or uh, compaction, which is also something we are missing generally when we are evaluating the performance of uh, our normal prop and fractured uh, wells. Um, so what we saw out of these uh, mechanistic models was that uh, in very thick uh, reservoir, uh, fish bones was uh, struggling co to compete, even when you put the uh, subs uh, very close uh, together. Uh, and that's uh, natural. The prop frac we expect to cover the entire pay thickness, uh, while fish bones is constrained to by the length of the needle. Uh, for the 25 meter case, uh, we found that uh, uh, fish bones with the 12 meter spacing give a very similar production and recovery as the prop frac. Uh, that's uh, more dense than what we will uh, be practically able to put into a well, uh, but the results were uh, uh, were positive enough that we wanted to. Uh, progress this further into a field uh, trial.
Um, another approach that you can use for modeling uh, fish bones uh, rather than the refined grid or perhaps in uh, conjunction with that uh, is to define a advanced to lower completion with the simulator that manages that, such as uh, uh, Reveal. Uh, so this was a case run to test it on another formation uh, in Valhall, uh, where uh, acid stimulation uh, is the standard uh, method. Uh, and there, in this case, uh, you got a little bit uh, less uh, production out of the fish bones compared to the uh, frac treatments. Again, of course, this is uh, depending on how those fracs are matched and what you assume about the uh, longevity and the growth uh, and uh, growth of those fracs. Uh, but and the fish bones here was compared to the performance of an open hole and then used the same uh, parameters for skin. And this again was a model with the KVKH equal to one. So maybe you would see more uplift compared to the open hole if you had a higher uh, vertical permeability contrast. Um, so in, in that uh, case, maybe this uh, uh, model doesn't give you a lot more than, uh, uh, again, using a more crude uh, type of uh, completion with your grid. Uh, but uh, the one thing it's uh, certainly good for is to show uh, management that you have uh, modeled fish bones in a very accurate way. And it can it can be useful for uh, maybe not evaluating the uh, resources with the well, but you can use it for sector models and comparing different uh, completion methods this way and run some sensitivities and build a advanced uh, lower completion. Uh, I'm going to jump over a bit to something that was done for the Eva Olsen field where. Uh, a mechanistic model was set up to test how the performance would uh, be uh, for chemical tracers or chemical PLT by tracers. Uh, so you built a uh, two-dimensional grid uh, with the low matrix permeability and the high uh, permeability in the fishbones uh, section or the fishbone needle uh, sticking out here. And then just uh, ran this for a flowing period, and then with a shut-in and a restart, uh, and tried to look at how uh, this uh, fishbone section could affect the response from the chemical uh, PLT. Um, so what you see is uh, uh, what you might uh, expect, that the uh, Fishbone's needle has a high local inflow during the uh, pre-production uh, phase. Uh, and then when you go into the shut-in, uh, you start to see a high uh, positive inflow in the fishbone section. And uh, even after 24 hours, there is still some uh, increase in the inflow in the fishbone section uh, compared to the other parts uh, of the well. And then looking at the restart, uh, you see relatively small change uh, from the first hour and then further on into the restart. Uh, but what we take away from this is that uh, it's likely that the fishbone section will cause uh, positive inflow during the shut-in and uh, then a potential cross-flow. Uh, and uh, this uh, can then make your interpretation of the chemical PLT more complex. Uh, and since you don't have uh, wellbore access for uh, this solution, then uh, your chemical PLT might be what you want to uh, evaluate the contribution from each zone. But the cross flow we recognize can make this uh, challenging. Um, so that was covering a bit on the measuring, so uh, modeling, so going on to how we measured this uh, from the wells where we tested it. Um, so on the Valhall, we have a large database of uh, pressure uh, transient analysis responses from historic wells, uh, and we 
typically run one uh, after a few weeks of uh, uh, of uh, cleanup and uh, steady performance to evaluate how the stimulation has performed. And uh, what we typically look for is that the well should have, uh, if it's a proper and fractured well, the uh, it, uh, if it's a good stimulation, then it typically matches the well length uh, nominally of the horizontal that has been completed uh, with the skin of uh, zero. Uh, so uh, when we put this uh, sector of, so we had a, uh, for G11 trial, we only completed the 350 meters in the toe section with fish bones. And then we had sliding sleeves to prop frack the rest, but we kept them shut in while we were testing the fishbone section. So we got uh, flow rates uh, directly from that and the pressure response. Uh, and looking at the PTA match, it actually matched quite well uh, on those uh, first buildups uh, on the well length. And uh, uh, actually, you could, it could seem like the skin is a bit less but uh, than what the model would suggest, but part of this uh, could be due to uh, changes in the well gradient during production and shut-in. Uh, so overall, the performance from the PTA suggested that this was uh, uh, comparing favorably to other stimulation methods. Uh, and then also looking at the uh, productivity index uh, from uh, this uh, pilot. Uh, of course, since it is a relatively short section, and uh, relatively thin as well, then on a normalized plot versus uh, thickness, length, porosity, and uh, oil saturation, it's not. Uh, it's going to be down here in the left side corner where the data interpretation is more challenging. But at least uh, it seemed like it was uh, performing uh, similar to other wells that are either prop and fractured and analogs or offset wells in the area so something close to the trend on the first month production uh, unfortunately for this case we had to run a system where we hoped to uh, limit the chalk uh, production uh, but uh, actually we ended up having two chalk influxes so we've gone back and uh, started from scratch to design a new system which would be both easier to scale up and uh, handle the risk of chalk production in a better way. So I'll talk about that uh, at the end. Um, for this case, we actually ran in with the coil tubing to uh, recover, because since we didn't uh, use the drilling system in this case, we used the jetting, then it was possible to run in with coil tubing after to try to cut those uh, needles. Uh, unfortunately, we bit over uh, a bit more than we uh, could uh, chew uh, on this second run here. Uh, so actually, we ended up with a fish basket uh, stuck uh, full of uh, st uh, stuffed with needles, uh, and uh, we made a bird's nest in the lower completion that uh, uh, would uh, uh, make it impossible to keep going forward further. We tried the four or five runs before we stopped. Uh, but uh, based on the needles that were recovered, uh, we saw uh, 42 meters out of the 192 meters uh, uh, collected. Uh, and that would suggest a deployment of 78%, uh, assuming that you were able to recover all of those uh, needles. So uh, if uh, you see things have broken off here a bit due to you were pushing down and uh, putting too much in, so uh, it's uh, likely that some uh, more is left in the well, and maybe this number is a bit lower. Uh, and uh, potential reasons for not seeing full extension. Uh, it's a relatively thin uh, formation here, so needles that uh, hit the cap rock uh, in the jetting case, we don't expect it to keep jetting into that, so that would uh, stop the needle, uh, no surprise. Uh, the same if your underburden is uh, too hard. Uh, the other thing is that the gap between the sub and the open hole could be uh, too high. We had a 5.8 inch sub and eight and a half inch uh, hole. So uh, potentially so some of those needles uh, uh, didn't get further due to that. Or 
Uh, you could have some clogged nostrils as we had some problems uh, displacing the mud uh, in this case. Um, but uh, I think it's uh, something to you know consider when you are evaluating the upside that 100% uh, uh, deployment is you know what you dream of, but uh, maybe you should have the reference case to be somewhat uh, lower than that, at least for the jetting case. For the drilling, uh, it's uh, harder to really know. And uh, there are, of course, other data points from uh, uh, other jobs that the Fishbones has done on this uh, deployment for the jetting. Um, final piece of data from the Valhall job is on uh, tracers. Uh, so what we did was to run in, well, or how do you say, inline tracers. Uh, so we don't uh, get any uh, measurement of flow in the annulus, but we have tracers sitting at different points inside the lower completion. And what that means is that if you have some production here from the toe section, then that is going to carry tracer from station two, three, four, and five, and six all the way up. So it's not going to help you with the uh, performance along this section. It will simply be on-off whether something has plugged for you uh, somewhere along here. Uh, and in our case uh, on Valhall, where we are uh, seeing a lot of chalk production, then this type of uh, surveillance is pretty, and we don't have the option to go in and uh, log it, then this kind of uh, surveillance is actually really useful. Uh, because it uh, tells us whether something has plugged inside the liner or not. And uh, these tracer samples, uh, even two and a half years after the well was put in production, and even after we had the well plug up in the heel section uh, due to chalk production two times, uh, we still see the tracers coming through from the toe section here. So that's suggesting that uh, even though you produced some chalk, you did not see any accumulation inside the uh, fishbones uh, section, and uh, you're still getting good uh, production out of that. Um, for the well that uh, was uh, tested uh, with fishbones on Ivar Olsen, uh, the pressure transient analysis uh, is uh, a bit uh, interesting. Uh, the well itself is uh, in the better part of the alluvial fan uh, in the Ivar Olsen, and that's uh, something to keep in mind uh, when the performance, because the performance seems relatively good, uh, but the well cuts uh, through the stratigraphy, and uh, maybe that limits the gain that you see out of fish bones. Uh, because you get a reasonably good uh, uh, KH product, which is similar to a MLT well in uh, uh, Skagerrak 2 uh, formation, uh, and it's uh, significantly higher than a neighbor well uh, with uh, in the alluvial fan, but which, which was also in a poorer part of the reservoir. So we don't really have great data for uh, benchmarking and it's hard to evaluate what the uh, gain from the needles uh, meant for that particular uh, producer. Uh, and uh, so what you could have uh, expected to see is maybe that you have a, a gain of uh, some skin uh, or some uh, high KV, KH ratio, and you can match it that way, but it's not really a, a unique uh, match. So I know we have some uh, uh, people from the Evalos asset on the call, so they might uh, support me if there's further questions on this uh, interpretation. Um, my final slide is just on the future development, and then I'm talking about uh, for the Valal uh, asset. So we are trying to make a system which uh, doesn't use acid as we see that has a risk of uh, destabilizing the high porosity chalk on Valhall, and we wanted to have a particle control uh, solution. So different uh, uh, 
concepts have been suggested and uh, worked to some degree. The first one was with the magnesium for aluminium outer tubes, which we tested in G11. But uh, this is very difficult to get the dissolution right. You don't want it to happen too early or you don't want it to happen at one point and then all your fluid goes through that one and you don't get to distribute the acid to the remaining thousand meters of your well. As we then went to look at dissolvable materials uh, where you could have dissolvable rubber or plastic that would uh, uh, be holding pressure and covering slots in the outer needle while you are drilling out and then collapse or uh, disintegrate while it's left for suspending in the reservoir. Uh, but it was uh, again difficult to get this to work under all fluids and all conditions that you could see and also make sure that you while you are sure that this will not uh, start to make a uh, start to leak during your displacement or while you're running in a hole. Uh, so the method uh, that uh, is looking very promising and uh, that we are uh, actually qualified now for the technology readiness level four uh, is a concept with uh, a collapsible uh, hose. So here you have a, a plastic that's uh, expanded due to pressure when you are drilling out and it covers these slots uh, which we want to produce from uh, during the production phase. And then when you put a drawdown of uh, 15 bar on this needle, then the plastic uh, uh, collapses in and uh, it uh, allows some space for production inside uh, the needle. And we've run a lot of tests circulating chalk through here to make sure that this is robust for, because we will always see some particles of chalk coming through here, but it should protect against the massive chalk failure and allow uh, grains to come through. So that's the one we hope to test uh, on the field uh, next year. Uh, that was my presentation uh, and uh, happy to take uh, questions. Yeah, thank you for a very good uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, you you, uh, you have spent all your time, but that's OK. Uh, we have some minutes before we end this. And uh, luckily, we have Bo and, and Christian also with us still. So if there are any questions to either of the presenters, but first uh, particularly to Fabian on his presentation on the modeling, raise your hand or just uh, jump in and ask a question. Uh, and Medi Medvedev, Medvedev. Oh, sorry yes. about my pronunciation. Oh, no, that's perfectly fine, <laughs> thank you. What interesting presentation, thank you. Fabian, question to you. Uh, when you said there is a modeling done on that one, I understand upscaling down everything. How did you manage to get, uh, is that increase the reservoir simulation time as well when you deployed it, the technology? That's first question. Secondly, I thought that you have uh, deployed it in the end of the world fishbone and some other part was a sliding sleeve. How do you allocate the PI for the for that uh, part of the world, like let's say fishbone completed? Thank you. Yeah, uh, so uh, it's going to increase the running time. Uh, so this uh, uh, model refinement was done on a mechanistic model, but not uh, implemented for the full field uh, model. Uh, I think there are tools you can use if you want to go that direction, uh, such as Intersect, but we haven't attempted that. So this was just done as a separate mechanistic uh, study on a smaller sector model. Uh, and then on the allocation, so we tested fish bones when all the sleeves were closed. Uh, and then when we open the sleeves, actually we don't have a good control of uh, the production allocation. So we made sure to take the time to test fish bones for uh, at least uh, six months. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, next question from Sinyun Susan Gu. Yes, thank you. I have a question to Fishbone. Uh, just now you mentioned in your presentation and uh, there are some application uh, for the this kind of technology we can use in a combination with uh, with uh, a screen plus uh, AICD. So and also you have some application with uh, slot liner. So do you have uh, any case histories to using 
combination with the uh, premium screen only instead of having the AICD, this kind of case. Because in our field, we're using the premium screen to doing the completion to, to control the sand. So do you have uh, this kind of case history? Yeah, we, we run on Eva Austin with uh, ICDs, but we, we need to have a check valve inside the screens because we need to have pressure while, while we are pumping out the needles. So we did one on Eva Austin. And uh, if for us, it doesn't give any difference if it's ICD or AICDs. You ju just need to have one, you need to have uh, a valve that you produce for. So if it's ICD or AICD, that, that doesn't matter for us. So we. We have three cases with screens, premium screens, so that were one on Eva Austin, two on Eva uh, Greg. If that was any, if that was an answer to your question. Uh, so the current uh, premium screen together with AICD, so they have a very special feature, which means the base pipe, there is no uh, no holes, so you can have a pressure integrity. But our in our field, we're using the primary screen. We don't use the ICD or AICD. That means the base pipe, you have proficient holes. So I'm wondering if uh, we can still using this uh, technology. I guess if it's uh, fully open, if you don't have any check uh, function, uh, you, you cannot deploy the needles because we need to add the pressure. So uh, yeah. Uh, I have another question is maybe somebody already asked uh, from the needle to the to the screen or to the liner uh, how to the junction area how 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 that area is connected with the uh, with the liner or the screen the needle in the junction area is any uh, pressure integrity in the junction area or is it fully open yes yeah, it's, it's open so uh so you will produce inside the microanalysis until you come to the main ball, and then you produce inside the, 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 the screens. So the production will be routed through the screens. OK, thank you. Thanks for that. And uh, Keisuke Yamamura, question again. Yeah, thank you. So I have two questions. The first one is, uh, to where did you install the inline traces in detail? And the uh, second question is, which software did you use to calculate flow profile during shadowing and just after the startup? Uh, so the flow profile was uh, uh, modeled using Intersect. Intersect. And oh, okay. the, uh, uh, you, you asked about the, where the inline tracer was positioned? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they were on separate subs between the fishbones subs. Oh, I see, I see. I understand. Thank you. Okay, uh, with that, I think we will close off. This has been a very interesting uh, three presentation sessions. So thank you all for participating. Uh, very good uh, participation, clever questions and good answers. So we thank you all and uh, go back to work. Bye for now. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.